As we discussed in the very first chapter, the division of labour is the way some humans perform some types of useful labour while other people perform others. In this chapter, Marx further analyses his discussion on the cooperation of labour by putting it into context with the division of labour and how it also became restructured and reorganised under a capitalist mode of production in the transition from handicraft production to manufacturing during the 16th to 18th century. But whatever may have been its particular starting point, its final form is invariably the same, a productive mechanism whose parts are human beings. Marx argues that handicraft production, now employing a larger quantity of workers under the control of one master or capitalist, the division of labour becomes restructured in two different ways that have the same outcome. The first is that handicraft production originally used many various independent producers. In the making of a carriage, for example, the wheels would be produced by some independent craftsmen who made wheels for a variety of crafts. The seats were made somewhere else that crafted a variety of upholstered goods. The harnesses by some other leather workers that would make leather for a variety of trades. And it would be painted by a different group of craftspeople that painted a variety of things. In manufacturing, however, these processes are all brought together into one building under one master and with the specific function of solely using their craft for the production of carriages only. Over time and repetition, each craft person, now without practice, loses their ability to perform their craft as a whole and instead becomes reduced to one specific task in the process of carriage making. The second way is the reverse of the previous. A capitalist would bring together a large number of workers who all perform the same type of work, each making the entire commodity. However, with the occasional need of an increased amount of products at a certain moment in time, for example, the work becomes temporarily redistributed between the workers. Each individual takes part in only one part of the production process to speed it up. However, with time, repetition and increasing quantities of production, this redistribution of work eventually becomes a permanent fixture. Either way, both methods reduce the labourer to one specific process within the production as a whole. Marx notes that this growth out of handicraft into manufacturing is twofold in its nature. It both unites many different handicrafts into one production process, but at the same time it separates them into specific roles of handicraft production into individual functions. The worker who performs the same simple operation for the whole of his life converts his body into the automatic one-sided implement of that operation. Consequently, he takes less time in doing it than the craftsman who performs a whole series of operations in succession. Now that the workers have been separated into single individual functions of the whole manufacturing process, repeating the same labour process over and over again, their skill in this specific task becomes more proficient. They learn to perform the one role better and faster than a craftsman who performed many different roles. This speed increases the productivity of the labour process, as does the repetition of the task, ensuring that there's less time between each piece of work. It is these skills which become passed down through generations, from the older workers to the new ones, and the variety of skills that were once performed by a single labourer become forgotten. As the workers themselves become more specialised in their tasks, so do the tools that they use to perform them. They become simplified and adapted to one specific function. Marx here notes that there's now 500 different types of hammers. Both the worker and their tools become perfected for one narrow task. However, this leaves them at being unsuitable for all other tasks. The worker is now trained for only one specific role, and if they desire to sell their labour power, they can only do so for this one role alone. Capitalism, in its thirst for increased productivity, creates and restructures the working process 
into these narrow fields, while simultaneously forcing workers into these roles, leaving them little room for alternatives. Each individual worker has become a finely tuned individual in the collective labour process. Manufacture seizes labour power by its roots. It converts the worker into a crippled monstrosity by furthering his particular skill as in a forcing house through the suppression of a whole world of productive drives and inclinations. Just as, in the states of La Plata, they butcher a whole beast for the sake of his hide or his talib, the individual himself is divided up and transformed into the automatic motor of a detail operation. Marx also notes how this specialization of the worker also results in injuries, illness and crippling of the workers as they force their bodies into dangerous tasks, unnatural movements and positions, and heavy lifting time and time again for their whole lives. The isolated group of labourers to whom any particular detail function is assigned is made up of homogeneous elements and is one of the constituent parts of the total mechanism. In many manufacturers, however, the group itself is an organised body of labour, the total mechanism being a repetition or multiplication of these elementary organisms. In this section, Marx breaks down manufacturing processes into two categories. The first is heterogeneous manufacture, where each individual part of the commodities are made by different labourers and the finished product is assembled at the end. He also notes that there's no actual necessity for all these individual labour processes to actually function in the same workshop or under the same capitalist, or as we often see today, even in the same country. The second category is organic manufacture. This is the process where each individual labourer performs one task on the unfinished product before passing it along to another labourer who performs a different role. An example Marx gives is that of needle making. A labourer works with the raw metal who cuts it down in size, who then passes it to another labourer who shapes it, then another labourer who polishes it and sharpens it, etc, etc. This becomes significant because certain parts of the process can take longer or shorter than others. Some require more skill than others, so more workers will be needed to be employed in specific roles and less in others. Also, some skills require more training or are harder to perform, which becomes reflected in a hierarchy in the wages received. Marx also points out that manufacturers also provide many specialised jobs that can be performed by anyone without or with very little training, here producing a class of completely unskilled workers. As the training or education for these roles becomes simplified because the roles become focused on only one task, then the value of the reproduction of labourers' labour power becomes dramatically decreased, especially from the class of unskilled workers. A significant point to note here is that all these workers now depend on the other workers to perform their own tasks. If a worker is slow, it becomes reflected in the worker after them who is waiting to perform their role. This dependence on the other labourers not only drives the individual worker to perform their job quickly and efficiently, but this in turn further drives the whole labouring process time to be socially necessary labour time. Here we can see one way how what is socially necessary is regulated by production itself. Since the production and the circulation of commodities are the general prerequisites of the capitalist mode of production, division of labour in manufacture requires that a division of labour within society should have already attained a certain degree of development. Inversely, the division of labour in manufacture reacts back upon that society developing and multiplying it further. With the differentiation of the instruments of labour, the trades which produce these instruments themselves become more and more differentiated. In section 4, Marx discusses some distinctions and contradictions between the division of labour within the workshop and the divisions throughout society in general. Essentially Marx's argument here is that society is a structure that has grown and been built around the trading and exchanging of goods 
by independent producers of commodities, who recognise no authority other than the laws of competition between themselves. Trade is unplanned, liberalism's divine right of the free market that regulates itself, after exchange not before. Within the production process, however, capitalism and its division of labour denies the labourer to be an independent producer. They must work for capital. The capitalists themselves, therefore, in their complete control over the ownership of commodities, become the only ones who can interact with this market of exchange and society itself. So society becomes structured around the capitalist class desires alone. Marx also points out how hypocritical the capitalist class are when they claim that the idea of society itself being planned and regulated is somehow blasphemous or an attack on some freedom of rights. Yet they organise their workshops and labour force in the exact same way. What is lost by the detailed labourers is concentrated in the capital that employs them. It is a result of the division of labour in manufactures that the labourer is brought face to face with the intellectual potencies of the material processes of production as the property of another and as a ruling power. In this final section, Marx notes how capitalism appropriates the free gifts of labour, which has existed long before capitalism, but somehow presents them in a way as if they were created by capitalism itself, while at the same time turning them against the labourers themselves. As we saw with the cooperation of labour and with division of labour, capitalism restructures them in a way that becomes used inwards against the labourers. In shaping labourers into more specified individual roles, it denies them their real individuality, their knowledge and mental capacities of labour as a craft, as an intellectual pursuit or of ways to shape and craft their own desires in the world around them. It makes the labourer and the labour as nothing but a simple physical process, a cog in a machine. Intellect, science, mental capacities, education and the desires for knowledge of labour processes and reshaping the world therefore become owned by the capitalist class and instead are dictated to the labourers. During the manufacturing period proper, i.e. the period in which manufacture is the predominant form taken by capitalist production, the full development of its own peculiar tendencies comes up against obstacles from many directions. Finally, Marx notes that despite all this, capital was still unable to obtain complete domination over the production process. Manufacture still relies and is dependent upon the hands and skill of the labourer, so the labourers still asserted some control over the production process. But the manufacturing process itself created the very things that would revolutionise production. Machines. <laughs>